Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Multiplexing on Mouse Tissue Using Cell Signaling Technology Antibodies and Opal IHC Method. I am Christy Joel of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Akoya Biosciences and Cell Signaling Technology. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that today's event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you like at any time you like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, you can use your Ask a Question box to let us know you're experiencing a problem. Additionally, this presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. After viewing the presentation, just click on the Continuing Education Credits tab and follow the process to obtain your credits. I would now like to introduce our speakers, Bill Kennedy, Reagent Specialist at Acquia Biosciences, and Chris Grange, IHC Specialist at Cell Signaling Technology. For complete biographies on our speakers, please visit our biography tab at the top of your screen. Bill and Chris, you may now begin your presentations. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Christy. Uh, hi, my name is Bill Kennedy, and I'm the Reagent Sales Specialist for Acquia Biosciences in the Northeast and Midwest. Today, I'm going to talk about using the OPAL method of multiplex immunohistochemistry in mouse tissue. Now, we all know that the tumor microenvironment is very complex, and we try to understand the biology, but traditionally, we've been probing this complex system with one or two dimensional techniques, mainly chromogenic IHC with DAB. Obviously, immunohistochemistry has been and is a vital tool in immuno-oncology and holds an important place in any anatomical pathology lab. But while other clinical labs are using tests that are automated and performed by calibrated instruments to reduce human error, the majority of anatomical pathology is still based on physician interpretation. DAB has been the gold standard, but the results are subjective. Other methodologies provide quantitative results, but with a loss of morphological context, so in the end, results are compromised. Multiplex immunohistochemistry allows us to visualize up to eight biomarkers in a single paraffin section, enabling phenotyping and quantitative analysis. Akoya's workflow, which we call Phenoptic, supports multiplex IHC from staining to imaging and analysis. Phenoptics enables you to see your biomarkers in morphological context, phenotype cells, and assess spatial relationships of cells. And one other thing that's really important that Phenoptics allows you to do is isolate and remove autofluorescence. We'll talk about that a little bit more in this presentation. Phenoptics is comprised of three different tools. We have the detection reagents, which include um, opal dyes, eight of them. The multispectral imaging systems, including the vector Polaris, and the powerful image analysis tool in form software. Today, we're going to focus mainly on multiplex IHC staining. Now, before we do that, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how IHC has been traditionally done. To do multiplex IHC in the past, there were a couple of options. You could use directly conjugated primary antibodies, but without signal amplification, often the signals are very weak. Uh, the other option that you have is to use secondary label fluorophores. With this method, you can amplify the signal somewhat, but you have to, be to carefully select the species of both the primary and secondary antibody to avoid cross-reactivity. If you have three markers, they must be from three different species, and that limits you to maybe three, maybe four colors. If you have weak signals, that leads to long exposure times, and then that leads to photo bleaching. And then there's always the problem of autofluorescence, and especially in formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue. Opal multiplex IHC is different. Opal allows you to do up to eight biomarkers on a section. It's compatible with any primary antibody, regardless of species. 
Um, as long as you have a secondary HRP for your primary antibody, you can use it with Opal. And you don't have to worry about cross-reactivity because after we do one round of Opal staining, we strip those antibodies. So what is Opal? Um, Many of you have probably heard of ceramide signal amplification or have used it in the past. Um, ceramide signal amplification technology has been around for 30 years and has been used in thousands of publications. Um, TSA uses HRP to amplify the signal and covalently bind to the epitope. Um, this covalent binding is what allows us to stain, strip, and then stain for the next antibody without fear of cross-reactivity. Now, what does the OPAL workflow look like? Um, the workflow is sequential, and it looks very similar to the staining that most labs are currently doing. You deparaffinize your slides, do your antigen retrieval, do your blocking step, add your primary antibody, your secondary HRP. Uh, it's very important that it's labeled with horseradish peroxidase. And then you add your OPAL TSA fluorophore. At that point, um, the opal TSA floor is covalently bound to the epitope, and now we can add heat to strip. Once the stripping is completed, um, we can repeat that process and start for the next antibody. We can do that up to eight times, and then um, add DAPI and mount. So here's a little cartoon that demonstrates a typical opal stain. The first primary, secondary HRP and opal flora added. Um, opal binds to the epitope and then heat is added. Now we're ready to add our next second antibody. The second antibody and detection are added and this process is repeated to stain up to eight biomarkers on a single section. With Opal, we get some really beautiful stains, and here's an example of a sixplex seven color stain imaged on the vector Polaris. We also have the ability to do a, a nine color stain with eight antibodies, um, and this was also imaged on the vector Polaris. Now let's talk about um, opal kits. Um, opal kits contain all of the reagents that you need for detection and come in multiple kit formats. We have a four color kit and a seven color kit. Uh, both of these are available for manual or automated staining. Um, we've also recently released a PD-1, PDL panel kit for both lung and melanoma. These kits have been optimized by Akoya and are ready to use on the bond system. Um, we've done the work for you, so you don't have to. And what we're going to focus on today is uh, the Opal Mouse Kit. And the Opal Mouse Kit um, comes with this anti-rabbit HRP secondary, and um, that's what we'll use with our CST antibodies. Of course, we have manual kits, but we also have automated kits that can be used on the Leica Bond RX and the Roche Discovery Ultra. Now on to the mouse staining. Um, in our lab, we did a six flex stain plus DAPI on mouse tissue, um, and we used mouse breast cancer tumors. Um, it was fully automated on the bond using six antibodies from cell signaling technology. Um, five of the six antibodies were rabbit monoclonals with the exception of one cytokeratin, which was a biotinylated mouse monoclonal. The six antibodies that were used were FOXP3, cytokeratin, CD31, CD4, CD8, and F480 for macrophages. Um, we used the opal four-color rabbit kit, and we added, added three additional fluorophores to make a seven-color assay. Um, this, this kit was designed for those rabbit antibodies in mouse tissue and contains everything that we need 
uh, to do the stain. It contains all of the detection reagents. Um, and then, like I said, we, we added those three opal fluorophores on top of what came in the kit. And here are the antibody fluorophore pairings, um, as well as the order that they were done in. These slides were imaged on the vector of Polaris, and here are the results. Um, this first image is from a mouse spleen, um, which stains nicely for five markers, but there's no cytokeratin in mouse spleen, so it's not here. Um, this was a really nice control, but when we moved it to um, the mouse breast cancer, these were the images that you get. Um, here are our six markers plus DAPI, and those are separated by channel. If we look at another image, um, we can see all six markers plus DAPI. There's nice staining, but in most of these samples, cytokeratin was ubiquitous in these sections. Um, so it, at some points it made it hard to read. So all we have to do is turn off one of the channels. So we turn off the cytokeratin channel. If we turn off the cytokeratin channel, we see some really beautiful staining of five biomarkers plus DAPI. Opal works really nicely with mouse tissue. I just want to touch on the imaging portion for a minute. Um, all of these slides were imaged on the vector Polaris. Um, the Polaris performs whole slide seven color multispectral imaging, as well as nine color field of view. Um, what makes the Polaris special is that it uses multispectral imaging technology which just allows us to unmix and separate colors as well as remove autofluorescence. And to give you an example of that, this image shows pancreas mixed and with autofluorescence. If we unmix, we isolate and remove the autofluorescence, giving us this image. So you can see this is a very powerful and will help you have confidence in your data. So in conclusion, seven color opal multiplex IHC is robust and reproducible on mouse tissue and expands the tools available to researchers. Um, using well-validated antibodies is important and that's why we use cell signaling antibodies. Now I'm gonna pass this over to Chris Grange from CST. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, this is Chris Grange here from Cell Signal Signaling Technology. And I'm happy to be here today to talk with you about the crucial need for antibody specificity in multiplex panels. As singleplex assays evolve into more complex multiplex assays, high quality validation has never been more important than it is today. Multiplex assays can offer tremendous benefit, such as maximal data per tissue section, which can be critical when working with limited human tissue samples. They also allow for the understanding of co-expression spatial organization of multiple targets and formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissues in the field of immuno-oncology and can expand the understanding of the tumor microenvironment. In this setting, it becomes crucial that highly validated antibodies are utilized. In traditional single-plex chromogenic IHC that is not often quantified, it is possible for researchers to work around or ignore some nonspecific signal. In the multiplex setting, combining multiple suboptimal antibodies can significantly confound results. For these reasons, we recommend that researchers choose antibodies for use in multiplex assays that have been highly validated and demonstrate significant uh, specific signal in FFPE tissues. Without rigorous validation in the singleplex setting, it would be impossible to de determine if all of the antibodies featured in this multiplex image of an LL2 syngenetic tumor are staining specifically. Today's talk will cover some principles of IHC validation that we use here at CST, what I like to call our IHC validation toolbox, in which I'll give some examples of the tools that we use in our work. I'll tell a sh short story about PDL1 species reactivity testing, and then I'll summarize our findings from today. 
In its most basic form, IHC validation can be broken down into two simple questions. Does the antibody stain where it is supposed to, and is there no stain where no expression is expected? If it can be explained so simply, then why is IHC validation so difficult? Two confounding factors are the biology of the targets and the abundance of different cell types in tissues. For many targets, the biology is poorly understood and the expression pattern is mostly unknown. With so many different cell types present in each FFP tissue section, it can often be nearly impossible to determine where staining should be present for more complex targets. It is important to note that the level and type of IHC validation differs for each target. Here we see a couple examples of targets with well-defined biology. On the top is an antibody directed against, against GFAP, whose expression is confined to the brain and peripheral nerves. As you can see, there is nice signal in the brain sections, along with a peripheral nerve of the colon. In other tissues, such as liver and prostate, no signal is present, as expected. On the bottom is an antibody against PMEL, which is a melanoma-specific antigen. We see nice signal in the melanoma cells in the images on the left, and no staining in the other images of various tumor types, as expected. While targets such as these are relatively straightforward, the majority of our validation occurs on more difficult targets. What makes some targets more challenging than others? Well, for some novel targets, there is little to no biological data available. In these cases, the literature can tell us very little about what cells and tissues we should expect to be positive. Conversely, some well-studied targets can also be challenging to validate in IHC, as the available literature can be questionable or even conflicting. I'd like to note that when reviewing IHC data in the literature, it must be evaluated critically in instances where strong evidence is not demonstrated for the specificity of the antibodies used. For these difficult targets, an increased variety of validation techniques are typically required. One must perform what is scientifically necessary to gain confidence in specificity. To that end, we have mostly standardized our initial validation strategy. We often start validation with cell pellet models. We generally identify many clones that stain as expected on cell pellet models, but eventually fail on tissue models. This again highlights the importance of performing multiple assays and using the appropriate tools to identify highly specific antibodies for IHC. Testing then moves on to one or a small number of tissues with either high, low, or no expression expected. If the observed staining seems appropriate, antibodies are assessed on multiple tissue types, which is facilitated by the use of tissue microarrays. From this point, we have a number of tools to further characterize antibody performance in FFBE tissues. As I mentioned before, we must do what is scientifically, scientifically required to gain confidence in specificity. Note the following statement. No single assay is sufficient to verify specificity of staining. It is not enough that the antibody performs well in one experiment, or on one high-low knockout cell model, or on one positive-negative tissue model. It is the use of multiple assays and strategies that helps build the case for specificity. I will go through a few examples of the strategies listed here. As I mentioned before, we often start with an FFPE cell pellet model. These cell pellets are fixed, processed, and embedded just like tissue samples. Cell pellets can serve as a useful first step in validation as they provide a system with known protein expression. In this example, you can see that this clone performs well by IHC and Western blot on cell lines of known positive and negative CD151 expression. This is an example of testing cross-reactivity of an antibody against its related family members. Such testing is performed for protein targets that share high sequence homology with other proteins. In this case, using cell lines transfected with related family members EGFR, HER2, and HER4, we can show that the anti-HER3 antibody detects just the HER3 protein and does not cross-react with other receptor tyrosine kinase family members. Next, I'll discuss the use of high and low tissue models in IHC validation. Here is a simple example of an antibody that detects smooth muscle actin. In this section of mouse heart, you can see that the antibody is staining the vascular smooth muscle as expected, while it is clean in the cardiomyocytes. This is even a good example of how we can use negative internal controls, in this case the cardiac muscle cells, 
to guide our validation. Here you can see how we are able to leverage publicly available RNA expression data in the human protein atlas to aid in validation. In this example, staining of CD39 correlates well with the high, low, and very low tissues predicted by RNA per the human protein atlas. Some other resources that can provide useful target information are Phosphocyte, BioGPS, and Uniprobe. As we have an increased focus in making most reactive antibodies that work in IHC, we have generated a number of rodent models to aid in the validation of these targets. As with human antibodies, we will test the most reactive antibodies on various normal mouse tissues and syngenetic tumor models. In the examples here, you can see that we were able to modulate protein expression using treatments. As you can see, phospho S6 expression was inhibited upon rapamycin treatment. Next, I'll briefly discuss how orthogonal or non-antibody-based assays can be used in IHC validation. Examples of orthogonal assays are mass spectrometry and RNA scope. Here you can see mass spec data that was performed on a cohort of lung cancers. As you can see, staining with an antibody directed against DLL3 correlates nicely with the protein expression levels detected by mass spec, giving us increased confidence in the specificity of the antibody. Performing staining with antibodies directed against two different epitopes is one of the best validation tools we have here at CST. In the case of NOTCH2, we expect to see membrane staining, along with some nuclear signal, representative of active NOTCH. But how can we be certain that the distribution and level of nuclear staining is appropriate? Fortunately, we were able to develop another clone that is directed against a different portion of the protein, also with the, within the intracellular domain. Since both antibodies detect independent, unique epitopes on human NOTCH2, and they show a similar staining pattern on multiple tissues and cell types, we can have increased confidence in the specificity of all of the staining observed. Confirmation of species reactivity is important to include if an antibody is predicted to react in additional species. Two SHMT2 antibodies were developed that show nice staining in, hum in multiple human tissues. The staining is mitochondrial as expected, and since the antibodies are directed at different portions of the SHMT2 protein, we can have confidence in these antibodies on human models. Both antibodies are predicted to react with mouse based on Western blot testing and high sequence homology with the mouse SHMT2 protein. As you can see, the antibody on the top shows nuclear signal in a subset of immune cells while on the bottom, diffuse cytoplasmic sig signal can be observed in pancreatic acinar cells. Note that both antibodies did not show similar nonspecificity issues in human tissues. It appears to be a mouse species specific issue, and therefore these antibodies are not suitable for mouse staining. Now I would like to briefly discuss some species specific testing that we did with a couple of our PDL1 antibodies. We recently heard from a customer that our human reactive PDL1 clone, catalog number 13684, was working well for them in most tissues. While a blast of the antigenic sequence of 13684 returned only a 56% homology with the mouse protein, we proceeded with the testing to compare our mouse and human reactive products. The first step was to compare the two antibodies on cells transfected with the mouse PDL1 protein. As you can see, both antibodies are able to detect the overexpressed PDL1, though the signal intensity of 13684, which is on the top, is clearly weaker. As we move to tissue testing, more differences emerged. Both antibodies seem to detect different subsets of immune cells in the mouse thymus. We can hypothesize that number 64988 on the bottom is more likely to be correct based on the stronger signal in the transfected cells, but more testing is required. On a syngenetic tumor is where major differences emerged. As you can see, the mouse reactive clone pictured on the bottom is detecting scattered immune cells in the tumor as expected. 
the human reactive clone on the top does not appear to be detecting those cells and also shows obvious nonspecific signal in the Renka tumor cells and adjacent muscle. If we had only tested one model, such as the transfected cells, or perhaps the thymus, we might be convinced that number 13684 is suitable for use in mouse tissues. Testing on multiple models and utilizing a comparison antibody were helpful tools in this situation. Without the rigorous validation I've discussed here today, we would not be able to have confidence in the staining we observed in a multiplex IHC setting. As I mentioned earlier, there is no way to determine if the staining of these mouse reactive panels is specific without first validating each antibody in a single plex setting using the tools discussed here today. So in summary, IHC validation should always be tailored to each target and various validation tools should be employed. No one assay is ever sufficient. Multiple assays synergistically combine to demonstrate specificity. Highly validated antibodies are crucial in multiplex assays to produce reliable staining results, thus enabling the researcher to make discoveries with confidence. I'd like to thank everyone for their time today, and now we would like to open it up to live questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Bill, for your informative presentation. We will now start our live Q&A portion of the webinar. Now to our audience, if you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Um, Bill, let's start with you. Can I use a rat primary or other species than rat antibodies on mouse tissue? Um, that's a good question, and the answer is yes. You can definitely use a rat primary, and as a matter of fact, you can use any primary antibody regardless of the species. Um, as long as you have a secondary HRP um, against that primary species, then it will work with Opal. Um, so the answer is yes. Thank you. Now, Chris, Let's pop over to you. I believe this one's for you. How can I avoid mouse-on-mouse -mouse reactivity when multiplexing in mouse tissues and tumors? Uh, Christy, for this one, um, the easiest way to avoid mouse-on-mouse -mouse reactivity when doing IHC in mouse tissues would be to use rabbit monoclonal antibodies. Um, all of the antibodies we displayed in the talk today were raised in rabbit and for this reason, they're, they're great choices for use in mouse tissues. Um, if you are required to use a mouse monoclonal antibody in mouse tissues, uh, for example, if there's not a good rabbit monoclonal available, there are some commercially available mouse-on-mouse -mouse reactivity kits that um, could possibly be used to, to limit mouse-on-mouse uh, -mouse reactivity. Thanks, Chris. So I, let's pop back to you. I have an antibody that works well with mouse tissue. I'm sorry. I have an antibody that works well in mouse tissue with DAB. Will it work with opal? And what adjustments do you recommend? So generally, if you have a mouse, um, an antibody that works well in mouse tissue uh, with DAB, then it's most likely going to work well with opal. Um, so generally, we recommend trying it with the same conditions that you have, that you've been using with DAB, um, you may find you have to dilute it two to four times or even higher, though. All right, thank you. We have some great questions coming in. Let's go, let's, let's see. Let's go with this question here. Um, what characteristics should I look for when selecting an antibody for use in a multiplex panel? Um, the simplest answer would be to look for high quality validation data. So if it were me, I would look for companies that display high quality images on the web and that show some of the tools that I discussed here today. Um, I guess the first place to start would be to look for if the company selling the antibody 
recommends it for use in IHC in paraffin embedded tissues. However, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be specific. Um, some companies uh, will display data that was generated by customers, uh, but here at CST, all of the data and images we display on the product pages for a given antibody uh, were all generated here in-house. So that should give our customers more confidence in the performance of our IHC validated antibodies. Thanks, Chris. Is it possible to quantify images using some machine learning approaches? Um, well, that's a good question. And with multispectral imaging, you're able to um, quantify your images. And we do that with um, Akoya's Inform software, which is some powerful um, software that will allow you to um, quantify your images. Thank you, Bill. Our next question, oh, we have so many questions coming in, looking for some duplicates here. Um, let's go with, um, here we go. Will all antibodies approved for use in IHC work with the Akoya opal reagents? Uh, Christy, the simple answer to that one is yes. Um, if an antibody is well validated in IHC using singleplex uh, chromogenic staining, then there is a very, very high likelihood that it will work well uh, with the opal uh, immunofluorescent reagents. Um, one thing to note, though, is that, for example, um, CST, at CST we have recommended protocols for use in the chromogenic setting where we tell customers the optimal dilution. Um, when you switch over to using opal reagents, there's a chance that that opt optimal dilution may change, and therefore um, researchers may have to do some uh, additional optimization work in that setting. Thanks, Chris. Bill, I believe this one's for you. I don't have a bond or ultra. Can I do this manually? Absolutely. You know, in the past few years, everybody's, uh, a lot of people have been moving to automation, but we still have a lot of customers who are doing manual staining. and. Um, as long as you have a microwave oven to do your antigen retrieval and stripping, um, you can do your staining manually. Thanks, Bill. Uh, can I use the same primary antibody dilution with chromogenic and fluorescent detection reagents? And Chris, this might be for you. I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, no problem. Can <laughs> I use the same primary antibody dilution with chromogenic and fluorescent detection reagents. Oh, right. Uh, as, as I mentioned in the previous question, um, there's a chance that you might be able to use the same primary antibody dilution that we recommend for chromogenic IHC, but more likely than not, because of the different sensitivities and signal intensities between chromogenic detection and the TSA-based detection with the opal kits, uh, you'll likely have to use a different uh, primary antibody dilution. And Chris, can you comment on using polyclonal primary antibodies, rabbit, et cetera? Yes, of course. Um, there's no reason you wouldn't be able to use rabbit or mouse polyclonal antibodies with uh, the opal kits. However, generally speaking, using monoclonal antibodies, whether it's rabbit or mouse, leads to more consistent signal uh, and consistent performance from lot to lot. And in an assay that's as complex as a seven or eight color uh, opal, uh, opal kit staining, then um, what we want to focus on is antibody consistency. So for that reason, we don't recommend using poly polyclonal antibodies. However, if it's the only option available, then it's something that can be considered. Thank you, Chris. Bill, are your multiplex kits limited to seven targets? You mentioned using nine opals. How is the spectra unmixing? So that's a good question. So in my presentation, I talked about um, doing six biomarkers plus DAPI. Um, 
Recently, uh, about a little over a year ago, uh, we came out with two new opal dyes, so that allows us to do eight biomarkers plus DAPI. On the um, Vectra Polaris, we have two, there's two options. Um, you can do whole slide seven color staining, um, and then you can also do field of view nine color staining. Thank you. Our next question. Um, so let's come back to you. Your presentation talks about a seven color stain, but I only want to do three or four markers. Is that possible? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, generally um, what, I, what I showed here today was that seven color. Um, we do sell kits that um, stain for four colors. So that's absolutely doable. And, it's, and to be honest, it's a good way to start um, staining for opal. Start, um, start low and then, then increase as you go on. Thank you. Now, what was used on the Cytokeratin C11 clone as far as MOM, MLM? Um, as Bill mentioned, that clone is biotinylated. So there was no reason to, uh, we didn't have to detect it with anti-mouse HRP. So that's how we avoided uh, any mouse on mouse Cross reactivity in that setting. Um, using just an unconjugated mouse monoclonal primary antibody, you would run into issues with uh, secondary detection and mouse on mouse reactivity. Got it. Thank you. How would I get the protocols for using multiple opal dyes on same species antibodies? We have on opals, Akoya, I mean on akoyabio.com. Um, under resources, um, we have a protocols page where we have um, a couple of different protocols for um, seven color stains, um, one, one being a mouse protocol. And then um, I can also uh, share my protocol as well. Very good. Thank you, Bill. Okay, our next question. Uh, and again, bear with me. We've got so many great questions coming in, and I want to make sure that I answer ones that everyone is asking. Um, how about this one? Is CST developing validated antibodies for brain cell markers, neuronal, astrocytic, and microglial markers? Uh, yes, we are. We have a whole development team here at CST focused on neuronal markers, and just recently, we've come out with um, a few new products that are recommended for use in IHC and paraffin embedded tissues. Uh, they include an IBA1 or a couple IBA1 antibodies, which are used to detect uh, microglia in the brain. Um, aside from that, I would suggest visiting the CST website to see what we have as far as new neuronal markers and customers can always contact us via tech support with any specific questions about new products or what we may have uh, coming soon in the pipeline. Excellent, thank you. The next question, uh, do you purchase Opal dye kits directly from Akoya? Yes, um, all of the Opal dyes are sold by Akoya and you can purchase directly through us. Very good, thank you. Um, let's see, how easy to optimize, or let me rephrase this, how easy is it to optimize a new antibody for a new antigen that replaces one of your standard protocols? And I know we have so many questions coming in, I can repeat that if necessary. Uh, uh, please, sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. How easy is it to optimize a new antibody for a new antigen that would replace one of your standard protocols? I think this question is referring to uh, a situation where you would have uh, an, an optimized opal panel and you want to substitute a new antibody for one that's been previously optimized in the panel. Um, in that case, it can be, it's not necessarily just that you plug in the new antibody, but um, my suggestion would be to test the new antibody in the panel where you plan, in the order you plan to place it. And then if those results are 
satisfactory, then great. If not, then uh, the panel will likely, likely require a bit more optimization and possibly changing the order of staining and which opal floor floors are used for each uh, antibody. Thank you. Now, when troubleshooting with opal reagents, would you recommend diluting opal ab colors if you are getting a lot of background? Um, so that's a good question. So there's a couple of uh, levers you can change when uh, optimizing an opal stain. Um, the first is uh, your primary antibody. If you're getting background, um, then it's probably your primary antibody that um, needs to be diluted out further. Um, if you're seeing your signal intensity is too high, then you it would dilute your opal dyes. Thank you. Our uh, next question. Uh, does CST have a good anti-mouse pan-CK antibody, preferably not raised in mouse? Um, the, the only option we have right now for a pan-cytokeratin antibody is the one that Bill spoke about in uh, the panel during this presentation. Um, as we mentioned, the particular variant he used is conjugated to biotin. Um, which helps us reduce or helps us avoid any mouse-on-mouse -mouse cross reactivity. Um, we don't currently have a rabbit monoclonal uh, that detects pancytokeratin in FFPE tissues at this time. Okay, our next question. I have an antibody that does not work well with DAB, but has been shown to work with directly conjugated secondary FL antibodies. Will it work with opal? Yeah, so um, in this instance, you know, I guess when I see that um, it's working with a secondary fluorescent antibody, I'm surprised that it's not working with DAB. But that being said, um, since it's working with the, your secondary conjugate, since opal is actually um, amplifying it even more than your secondary conjugate, um, then, then you should be able to get amplification of that antibody, and so it should work with opal. Very good, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's go with our next question. Um, uh, let's go here. Um, Yes, let's take this question. Can I use an antibody created in a species other than mouse or rabbit, for example, rat? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, basically, with the opal uh, technology and the opal kits, you can use an antibody that was raised in any species. The limiting factor would be having an HRP-conjugated secondary antibody that detects uh, in anybody raised in your in your species of interest. So if you had an antibody raised in, for instance, something like a chicken, you would need an HRP conjugated anti-chicken secondary uh, in order to use that antibody in the the opal kits and in the multiplex setting. But uh, the simple answer is yes, as long as you have an HRP conjugated secondary antibody to detect your primary antibody then you can use antibodies raised in any different species that you would like. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Bill, can multiplex opal dyes be visualized on standard confocal microscope or a Vectra and Mantra system, or, or are the Vectra and Mantra systems necessary? Um, yeah, so the, the answer is uh, yes, it can be visualized on standard uh, confocal microscope or even your standard fluorescent microscope. Um, you know, as long as you have the correct laser lines or filter sets in place, um, you'll be able to use opal. Um, the vector and mantra are nice to have um, because if you want to move beyond those three or four colors where you're getting um, spectral overlap, um, then, then if you want to get to those seven or eight colors, then you most likely would need um, a multispectral instrument like the Vectra or Mantra. Thank you. And I'll try to reword this question. Does the opal technology permit to detect intracellular targets? Uh, yes, just like in standard 
single-plex chromogenic IHC on FFPE tissues. Um, the oval kit can detect proteins that are expressed on the membrane, in the cytoplasm, and in the nucleus. So it doesn't necessarily matter where your protein is expressed. You can easily detect it with both chromogenic IHC and the opal technology. Thank you. And Chris, both your talks, you and Bill, both focus on antibody specificity for FFPE tissues. What about fresh frozen tissues? How do antibodies develop for FFPE tissues generally perform on fresh frozen tissues? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, we have found that generally, if an antibody works on FFPE tissues, it is very likely to work in fresh frozen tissues. Um, it may require a bit of additional optimization to get your protocol right, but for the most part, if it works in FFP tissues, it's likely to work in fresh frozen tissues. Now, I will say it doesn't necessarily work the other way around, right? So if an antibody works in frozen tissues, there's definitely some um, uncertainty about whether it would work in FFPE tissues. My recommendation would be that if you have an antibody that you know works in fresh frozen tissues, you would need to do some pretty high level validation work in FFPE tissues before you were confident that it's uh, staining specifically in formalin fixed tissues. Thank you, Chris. Well and we have time for a few more questions, but I want to remind our audience that those questions that we are unable to answer today, because we have a lot of questions coming in, and additionally, those questions that come in during the on-demand period, those will be answered via the email address you provided at the time of registration. Okay, let's do a few more questions. Um, Bill, over to you. Could you share some of your validation data for your opal detection and its heat application that strips prior antibody complexes? Um, so basically, uh, are we, we're asking for a protocol here. Um, yeah, we can, uh, we can share some of that. Okay, great. We have their email address. Okay, and Bill, let's um, stick with you. Can you please clarify the specific protocol differences between hand staining and automated staining using your platform? Yeah, um, so there, the... Um, Obviously, it's a little bit different putting slides on the Bond or the, ultra, the Discovery Ultra. Um, the main difference is being um, the heating steps. And so with uh, manual staining, you're using the microwave. Um, and with the Bond and uh, the Ultra, you're not. You're just using, you're just using heat. So there's little differences there. Um, the protocol time uh, to do it on the Bond or the Ultra is just basically an overnight stain. It's an overnight run, um, whereas the um, doing it manually just takes a little bit longer. Thank you, Bill. And thank you, Chris, both of you for your presentations today and for this informative Q&A. I want to one more time remind our audience that we did have so many questions that we were unable to answer due to time today, but they will be answered via the email address you provided at the time of registration. I once again want to thank Bill Kennedy and Chris Grange for their time today. But I want to thank LabRoots and our sponsors, Akoya Biosciences and Cell Signaling Technology, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand, and LabRoots will alert you shortly via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. A survey will now pop up on your screen. Your participation, your participation is greatly appreciated and it helps us improve our webinar program. That's all for now and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great day.